Welcome to Machine Minds, where technology and humanity meet. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, a recruiting and search business focused on the robotics and AI industries. The Machine Minds show is where we dive deep into the intricate world of robotics and artificial intelligence. As a staffing industry leader with a passion for the frontiers of technology, I'm pleased to be bringing you intimate conversations with the founders, investors, and trailblazers who are at the heart of the AI and robotics revolution. In each episode, we dig into their journeys, the applications of the products they're working on, and the breakthroughs that are shaping our future. Join us as we explore how these machine minds are transforming the way we live, work, and understand our world. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about this amazing field, you'll learn something new with each episode. Let's delve into the extraordinary. Let's delve into machine minds. Hello and welcome to Machine Minds. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, your robotics talent search partner. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Micah Green, founder and CEO of Talos. Thanks for being on the show today, Micah. Hey, Greg. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. Let's jump into it. So Taylor started like nine years ago or, or more now in your dorm room, obviously humble, very ambitious beginnings, uh, which I'm sure <laughs> yeah. a lot of our uh, listeners can probably uh, relate to. We've got a lot of first time founders and, and current founders. So can you take us back to that moment and what your initial idea was and how you went from that stage and that kind of project into a fully fledged company? Yeah, hundred percent. So. Uh, since I was young, at the age of like seven years old, I was obsessed with building things and especially the company kind of mentality. And uh, my grandparents started companies. My mom was a serial, is a serial entrepreneur and uh, really kind of caught the bug early on. So loved it and knew that's why I'm here, what I want to do. Um, and then I also was a robot nerd from a young age. <laughs> uh, I had been building different robots and then eventually did some international competitions uh, fell in love with that. And it kind of followed that same theme of building something from nothing. Um, and it was this interesting culmination because I, I wanted to pursue the business side, the entrepreneurial side. Uh, so I ended up, you mentioned college, I was at Cornell. Um, and there's a entrepreneurship program as part of the hospitality school. Uh, and in the hospitality school, we actually have to work as housekeepers as part of one of our classes. You can't pass the class until you work a shift. Uh, and that sparked a lot of curiosity for me. Uh, definitely not the sexiest thing necessarily, but um, but it was so interesting how it's been so stagnant. And it was the same thing that uh, they were teaching 50 plus years ago at this you know leading edge hotel. And uh, the operations really hadn't changed at all. So um, I'm kind of a believer that you know some people say, if it's not broken, don't fix it. I think everything's broken. I think everything can be improved in different ways. And as part of that, uh, you know, kind of brought together these ideas of uh, there's a huge labor crisis in the industry and, you know, robotics was finally getting to a point where the technology was ready uh, and affordable to a point where you could build things that could drive an ROI for the end users and operators. So that combination came together. And yeah, literally, I remember uh, kind of digging into it a little more. There was a, a, one of the first days was there was an engineering career fair at school and they had a startup section. Uh, I was like, I need to be there. I need to get a team together because uh, this new accelerator program said I would be able to join if I got a team. So that was the first priority is get a team. <laughs> um, and I literally had this booth uh, where I had my friend just uh, down the hall in the dorm uh, print out this logo that we used and got rid of pretty quickly. <laughs> but um, we printed it out on the, you know, using FedEx Kinkos and I had this banner that I put on this table with a couple of articles about robots and hospitality. And uh, that was pretty much the first day. It was uh, trying to sell engineering students, really smart engineering students on uh, going down this journey. And I, at that point, had no idea uh, what we were going to be building, just robots in hospitality. Uh, and eventually kind of figured it out later. <laughs> that is really cool. So wait, was the career fair at your college as well? Or it was a different yeah, so yeah. it was a Cornell Engineering Career yeah. Fair. So there was, you know, Apple and SpaceX and then my little booth. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah, <laughs> <China. Kinko's> banner. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so cool. 
Wow. Yeah. Okay. Talk about jumping in head first. All right. So you were trying to hire people yeah. before you had a real company or what you knew or knew what you were going to build. So that's um, yeah. straight into it. And obviously early days, things have changed a lot since then. So can you talk to us about in terms of like the product direction and the mission over the years, how that's kind of formed and, and what everything looks like now? Yeah, hundred percent. So the nice thing was I did have the context of the operation. I I uh, knew there was a problem with labor. I knew I wanted to get, you know, bring robots into space. So I literally had time stamps of uh, time recordings of each task individually within housekeeping and uh, and then did a ton of customer discovery around that time. And even after that engineering career fair, uh, which was successful, got a, got a few engineers uh, from Cornell willing to take that flyer. Um, but after doing a lot of customer discovery, Really, what I kept hearing was that, of course, the labor crisis is there. Housekeeping is a big part, a huge part of that labor gap and uh, the turnover issues that they're facing. Um, and I, I started looking at the stats and really found that vacuuming and floor cleaning uh, is one of the larger contributors of time. It's about like third on the list, third or fourth in terms of their tasks. Uh, and it was the second highest contributor of injuries in, as well. Um, and then the other side too, is that housekeepers have the second highest rate of entry in the entire private sector. Um, so, you know, thought about that in, in that context too. So anyway, I, I say all that because that was the foundation to say, okay, this is what we need to build. So we had enough data at that point and we need to focus on commercial floor cleaning. Uh, and to be honest, it was viable. Um, I wanted to build a robot to make beds initially. Uh, talked to some of my robotics advisors and, you know, they, they laughed a bit and uh, <laughs> yeah. And I, I wanted to challenge them and say, no, no, no I'm going to prove you wrong until, uh, you know, little did I know, uh, floor cleaning is also really difficult. Um, it took millions of dollars and many years to, to get to where we are, but, um, but conceptually too, people were willing to do that. So, um, so yeah, we were kind of off to the races during that accelerator with some of those engineering students and, uh, ended the program with a very much wiry, um, you know, prototype that looked like just a kit basically, uh, to prove out the value. You could build something somewhat affordably that could do the job. Uh, and with that, we were able to attract some of the biggest brands to sign up with us, uh, in the industry and hospitality. And then, uh, got, ended up getting a phenomenal, um, you know, team starting to, to get built out around with. You know, there's a PhD student from Cornell, there's some people from Georgia Tech uh, to really bring this into the next level. Um, and when they came on board, they said, okay, we're, we're throwing this away uh, and have this prototype. And we basically started from scratch again in that fall of 2015, uh, where we were just going quickly, you know, that, that grind to basically iterate, test, uh, get feedback from certain properties that were local. This was in Ithaca, New York at the time. Um, and really it, it took us, I'd say, yeah, realistically about six, six plus years to get to a product that now I am extremely confident in and, uh, that we're scaling up today. So won't get into all the weeds there, but there's a lot of iteration cycles, a lot of lessons learned, uh, a lot of kind of babysitting robots throughout that process to, um, to get there. Well, I want to dive into a lot of that, yeah, because I think it's super valuable to share and for people to to hear. But, you know, starting a company while at college, that's not easy. It's obviously no small feat. Um, you had, it sounds like, some of like the foundational knowledge from your mom being serial entrepreneur as well. But what were some of the biggest challenges you initially faced during those early days, apart from hiring the team, which you kind of jumped straight into? <laughs> Yeah, no, and that was uh, hard in itself, and then turned out maybe weren't the right people up front either. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I I think in terms of, I mean, honestly, yeah, convincing my parents to let me take a leave of absence was a, one challenge because uh, I ended up dropping out of school to do it. Um, but that that wasn't too bad. But then, you know, something that's been challenging for the past nine years, and uh, is maybe you know a, a big has been, had a big impact on me is uh, just fundraising and finding people who believe in this mission. And, you know, the, the question of like, why would somebody, you know, put in hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into this freshman college student uh, who, you know, didn't go work at Google or SpaceX or, you know, whatever it might be. And 
um, I didn't have too much of a track record outside of, you know, smaller businesses that I started. So convincing people and, and maybe not even convincing, but finding the people that really believed in me, uh, believed in the mission and the potential that it had, uh, that took time. And I, a lot of no's, a lot of, uh, sleepless nights throughout that process. And I mean, that's quite frankly carried through today. It's not, it hasn't gotten easier. Uh, and I know robotics as a whole, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy for sure. And then also, I think you've gone through in that nine years, you must have gone through all of those cycles because we had like a bit of a high, yeah. uh, not high, but money was cheaper, right? So people were investing and everything yeah. like that. And we've gone back the other way. And I mean, slowly coming back, but it's tough. I mean, the stage, what stage are you guys at now? Series B, is that right? Yeah, we're at Series B company. So it's even more difficult, I think, when you get into yeah. that stages, like your CD rounds, it's tough. Um, and I mean, we could talk about that in more detail, but um, I'm curious for you, because obviously every company has their moment where it's like, wow, this is feeling real. Like you hit your first big win. You guys went through the accelerator and everything like that. But was there one moment for you guys where you were like, wow, this is really happening now. This is a company. This is something that I'm... I'm going to see through. Yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, during that period, first of all, even in that summer accelerator, I had no idea I was going to drop out or, you know, pursue this. I thought, let's give it a shot. Let's see where it goes. Um, but things kind of moved pretty quickly and escalated quickly. So, uh, you know, one of the moments I'd say that was like a huge, uh, boost and, and just this shift of the trajectory, the potential was we actually signed some MOUs, um, memorandums of understanding with, uh, two of the biggest hotel brands in the world. And, um, you know, when that happened, I, the funny thing I was just telling someone the other day, I had a miniature uh, 3D printed plastic replica of what it could be when we signed those. There was no, <laughs> there was nothing really, um, but we signed them up. They were willing to pay. They were, you know, and and to have like the two industry leaders Say this is a huge problem. I remember one of them, the SVP, said, "This is a crisis. This is not a. We're not dealing with the labor shortage. We're dealing with the labor crisis." Um, that was, I'd say, the moment where I said, "Okay, we're really onto something, and there's huge potential there." So, wow, that's huge. I guess on the flip side of that, there's also like setbacks, right? And every company, especially the early stages, has something like that. You mentioned hiring people that in the end maybe weren't the right ones or whatever, but what setbacks tested your resolve and uh, as a company, just like your willingness to win? Yeah. So I'll, I'll continue that story a little. So I, I signed those MOUs, biggest brands, super exciting. They were willing to pay, started having some investor conversations. They were getting excited as well. Well, then my team went on strike, this engineering students literally didn't show up. And I, I thought, oh, you know, maybe people are just coming into the office later today. Oh, maybe, you know, they're on a walk or they they got a meal together. That'd be really nice. Uh, as a, you know, optimist, so it was all these positive. Okay. Until five, I was like, what the hell is happening? No one showed up for hours and hours that day. Uh, and I got a text from someone that said, we're not coming back till we have agreements on the table. Um, because the money started, it didn't start to roll in at all, but the potential through investors and through, you know, uh, and to be fair, at that point, I, I had no idea where we were headed. We just had like NDAs and um, there there was just, this was like a cool experience. So that was one of the first setbacks was like, whoa, I, <laughs> I, I'm i dealing with a team that I thought was very excited about this, that is refusing to work until they have, you know, some sort of uh, payment plan set up. And yeah, so we worked through that. I, I rushed to the lawyer's office and got that sorted out. Um, and, you know, that we got through that fairly quickly, but. That was just a, a unique one, I'd say. Uh, and then, you know, really, the, it comes down to kind of two big things, I'd say, which is the fundraising, you know, took, took a bit, uh, but then also the product side of things, like the getting to a point where the product sells itself, people love the product, and most importantly, it's, it's reliable, because the concept sold itself. But robots are hard. <laughs> Our robots have hundreds of components, very advanced technology, so many different components that connect together, of course, through electronics. And, um, and it's, as I mentioned, it took six years. So there's been, there's a lot of efforts, a lot of relentless perseverance, one of our core values, which is 
to, to get to that point and to see that light uh, through the end of the tunnel because it, it got quite dark uh, a lot of that time. And, you know, it's hard to keep that going without the progress that comes from that foundation, from a product that is starting to fly off the shelf. So, yeah, yeah, that's a thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah, it's never easy, probably definitely not at the time, but even to reflect on it, right? You're like, wish we didn't have to go through that. So you, you guys yeah. have obviously come a long way as a company, but then also from the initial concept, which sounds like when you were selling, it wasn't really even there. But can yep. you walk us through some of like how the technology has evolved um, over the years and what some of the technological breakthroughs have been for you guys? Whatever you can share. Obviously, I know some of it's secret source. You probably want to keep yeah. close to your chest. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think some of it, there's been an evolution kind of on all fronts of the technology We're we're really, we've designed it all in house, but we're leveraging certain off the shelf components like LIDAR sensors, which I'm sure a lot of the companies you talk to use or look at uh, camera technology, things like that. So I remember when we started the LIDAR that we use today was thousands, maybe $6,000. Uh, now it's, you know, in the hundreds of dollars. So the ability to use those technologies, those enabling technologies uh, in a way that's affordable and that you can start to deliver much better results and, and you know, a better solution because of that. Uh, the LiDAR is one example, but that's across the board with all sorts of chips and electronics that we use uh, today. So that's, I'd say, one piece of it. And then, of course, the software has changed. We use ROS and have built a lot of custom algorithms ourselves too. Uh, and ROS, I mean, there's ROS, 1.0, now there's 2.0, um, and kind of future iterations from there too. And uh, that has also helped a lot in terms of our ability to at least have a starting point uh, to be able to, you know, develop better software and a better solution. Uh, and then, of course, you know, there's the generative AI hype train right now, but, but it's very useful and uh, it's very valuable in different ways for our business too. So, we use that in multiple different ways from a product development standpoint, all the way to a customer support standpoint, uh, where we can actually have chat GPT, uh, look at data runs before we need to, if there are issues and that helps scale things up significantly too. So I could go on for days, but those are kind of the key categories I'd say that have changed where, uh, we were able to prototype iterate, uh, much more quickly, uh, than we were, you know, than maybe if we'd started this 15 years ago. So, yeah, but that definitely helped. Timing is a huge thing. I mean, everything converging with lower cost and more ability and stuff like that is definitely huge for everything we're seeing at the moment. And the industry is super exciting. Just happy we're part of it. <clears throat> the, the industry as a whole, uh, it's obviously very competitive, right? And it's always, it's rapidly evolving. Some of the technology you just mentioned there has like come out so recently. How do you ensure that Taylor stays ahead of the curve in terms of innovation and technology, or at least like embraces the new things that are coming out? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, there's a lot of different resources we've used. We've gone to like Roscom, we've gone to different robotics conferences and things like that to kind of see the latest and greatest in terms of libraries and in terms of approaches. Um, there's a lot of documentation and publications out that I know uh, my team you know, really leans into as well to stay ahead of that. Um, and then the nice thing is I'd say the robotics industry has been growing a lot. It's also very tight. Like I've, I've had some really good, uh, relationships built over the years with other founders or their, you know, whether it's a CEO, CTO, uh, other people out there where you can start to see what they're doing, or I can start to talk to them about, Hey, we're having this issue. Uh, how did you approach it? And, um, there's more of a culture I'd say around open source where at least around, you know, let's help each other. Let's raise the tides together. Um, so just learning from people like that and building that community, uh, which has been super helpful on all fronts, uh, in terms of having others, as I mentioned, you, you spoke with Rajat from chef robotics. Like he's an example of somebody that, uh, can pick his brain and, you know, he can pick mine and we can support each other, uh, throughout different challenges we have. So that's been huge. Awesome. The network I think is crucial, the founder yeah. network and then just the industry network and, if you aren't getting out there, meeting people, being part of, obviously you were part of an accelerator program, but I'm sure there's other programs and entrepreneurship programs and round tables and things like that, conferences to go to meet people and share. 
other people are going through the same challenges, you know, and people have overcome things that you are right now. So I think that's a, a great point to bring up and a great thing for people to be uh, put at the forefront of their mind when they're going through these journeys. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the reason we are where we are today and the reason, you know, we're still a company, but have now scaled to a pretty substantial point uh, is because of the people we have around us. That means the team, the advisors, the boards, you know, investors, people that have been through it. That uh, I remember talking to one of our board members who um, sold their robotics company for quite a lot uh, and very successful in the space. Uh, I was like, I would like to help you so you don't have to repeat the same mistakes I've made because I made a ton of mistakes. <laughs> and now I feel that way when I'm talking to people because I've made a ton of mistakes myself. And um, yeah, it's a, a culminating that information and getting all these different perspectives is extremely valuable. There can be mentor whiplash, there can be contradicting feedback, but at the end of the day, that's like, it's been one of the most important things for me and for the team um, to get that support. So we don't have to recreate the wheel or try to. That's perfect. Well, let's talk about team as well. Cause I mean, I'm biased. I believe yeah. strongly in teams. I help hire and, and build teams all totally. the time. Um, but have, have you, as the company has grown, you've likely had to make more crucial hires, probably replace that initial team that all went on strike, things like that. How, yeah. how important <laughs> has it been for you to get on board, not only individual team members, but then the board or advisors or even investors, because they are all part of your wider team, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, the most important thing I'd say, um, or one of the most important things is again, surrounding myself with people that are way smarter and more capable in specific areas, um, and finding those people. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the cliche, but it's so true. It's like, it's not, it shouldn't be understated. And I've made a lot of mistakes on that front, uh, of bringing on the wrong people, or like you said too, um, having people on maybe for too long that, you know, it, the company outgrew them and they weren't able to keep up. Right. And, um, and that's a tough thing because for myself too, I'm, I'm constantly needing to grow to be able to bring this company to the next level. And, um, not always perfect at that, to be honest. Right. So it's, it's like, how do you stay up with the task at hand and with the needs uh, of the business? So, um, so yeah, in terms of the, the team side, um, luckily got some really good connections through, through this kind of went back to, to mentors and advisors of, uh, who are the best people, you know, in the industry. I, I went to professors at Cornell in robotics and asked and started to get really good leads that led to some people joining the team. Um, and you know, it, it ultimately has been an evolution. Like we've gone through different leadership teams throughout this nine years and just being open about it. And, uh, some of that's because we, the company outgrew them. Some of that's because they, you know, had concerns with the risk versus reward profile. Um, and, and there've been, you know, setbacks in the company. Uh, and you know, so it's been this evolution, uh, and you know, now today I feel extremely confident with where we're at, with who we have on the team. Uh, and we are a lean team. We've, we've been, we've stayed lean and we've wanted to be uh, a company that is sustainable and not just, you know, necessarily pump in crazy amounts of money and spend it and try and hire hundreds of people right off the bat. That's, that's not kind of my mentality about it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, reflecting back on it, like if I, if I could change one thing um, or multiple, it'd be really thinking through the hiring process, getting the absolute best of the best and then making certain decisions sooner if they weren't the right fits. And that, that touches on, you know, the skill set, of course, that like that's kind of table stakes. Uh, but there's also the cultural fit and, you know, we've had, uh, a plus players, a plus, you know, in, in different ways, whether that's engineering or commercial or operations, whatever, but, um, you know, they're toxic. So they're toxic. Eh? And that's, that, can be just as disruptive as somebody who can't, you know, meet the task at hand. And then the startup fit mentality too, right? It's, that's kind of the other category. Those are the three buckets that I mainly look at. Are they up for this? Maybe they're phenomenal skill set, phenomenal culture fit, but this takes a lot and there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into it too, which, um, yeah, you need people to be willing to embrace that. Yeah. Um, 
I'm just smiling because anyone that regularly listens to the show just knows that you're just saying the things that I say. <laughs> so, so it's yeah. great. Yeah. I don't really have much more to, to add to that. But yeah, you know, the, the hiring slow, firing quick kind of mentality is, um, I think there's a lot of value to that when you're moving quickly uh, and when you've got a small team. Because if someone is, like you put it, toxic, the ripple effects of that bad employee is just detrimental in multiple ways you know deadlines milestones culture engagement etc could go on um so that i think that's super important um and then the the outgrowing you seem you know what it is i think part of what i was going to say is you even for a first time founder in a, a company at this scale at this stage you seem very uh, aware self-aware and try to not be the bottleneck um, where there are founders that, you know, I've worked with in the past and we hear horror stories about, but it gets to a point where there's too much control or they think that they can do all of the things better and it's hard to relinquish control. So they can't hire the key people to scale the company or um, grow the team or empower their team to do the best work. Um, and that is also something that, you know, as an employee for the employees, the individual contributors out there, maybe that are looking should be aware of when you're interviewing with a leader or a founder. But obviously the flip side is that is someone like you that is trying to improve, trying to do better, knows where your limitations are, knows where you need to improve and like bringing in people better than you in certain areas and then empowering them, which is key to a company's success, I believe. Yeah, oh, totally. And that's um, really been like kind of a consistent mentality I mean, I, I'm a believer in like the, maybe the opposite of the standard belief, but, um, I think power is when you can give up power and when you can relinquish that, like you said, it's you're in control in a sense, but you're starting to delegate that, distribute that, um, to people again that are maybe better in that specific area and, um, have that experience or, or even just think in a different way. Right. And that's a cool thing about robotics. I'm sure you see is you have such unique diverse backgrounds and skill sets so being able to bring those and connect those dots you'll be able to get a lot more uh, or at least we've been able to get a lot more from that and having you know engineering team members comment on marketing materials or a video uh, or marketing and you know customer success team members commenting on product and software approaches like that that kind of communication collaboration is just so it's been so helpful for us um, to get, you know, to solve problems in better ways. So for sure. Yeah. That's interesting. How, how do you think, or what do you think makes Talos as a company or product stand out in the market and continue down this successful path that you guys are on? Yeah, for sure. So uh, there's, there's a couple ideas that we like to flip on, its head. And I think that helps a lot. So, um, one of them is, this is, there's like a book on this too. The best UI is not needing UI. Uh, so how do we get there? We're not totally there yet. That's, that's this North star that we have as a team. Uh, and that's not just for, you know, it's user experience, not just UI on the robot, but the entire experience from, you know, a lead coming in to our pipeline all the way through to six months after they launched the robot and they're using it day to day. Uh, how do we make that as self-serviceable as possible? Um, how do we make it as easy as possible? So something that we did on the robot is uh, there's no setup, there's no mapping uh, that's needed for our cleaning robots. And uh, that's extremely unique in this industry and especially in commercial uh, robotics just isn't really a thing. Um, so, so that took a lot of time <laughs> and years to develop all the software on the back end to be able to have that front end experience for a user. Um, there's a play button. That's it. There's no text that you need to read or go through. That's how you use the robot. You put Just it anywhere it you want and press play. Yeah. You press play <laughs> and walk cool. away is our slogan. Wow. Um, okay. and you know, and it's still way more advanced and efficient than other robots out there in the market today with that. So. There's been a lot of things that it's not easy. It's easy as you use it, but all of the stuff on the back end to help support that. Um, I think that stands out. I think when you think about Apple as a company, which is definitely inspiring, I'm sure for many, including myself, um, the, the universal 
element of their products. The fact that, you know, I could have my, um, aunt, uh, who, you know, hasn't been as exposed to technology all the way to, uh, a six year old cousin or kid, <laughs> uh, you know, be able to use that same technology like that. That is how I feel like you can adopt and, and really transform society. Um, so I think the user experience and thinking through that in a pretty obsessive way and sticking to those guidelines is huge. And then, uh, we're also pretty much the first in this space. So, um, you know, creating a category is exciting. It comes with a ton of challenges. Um, but being able to, to have so much data of like, what do customers love? What do they hate? What, you know, having the brutally honest conversations and, you know, having the thick skin, you know, to be able to have those and, and just hear the reality and hear the, like, you know, I hate this robot because all this, like those tend to be the most valuable conversations. Um, and, and we have a lot of data there too. So I think, um, I could go on a lot about like the technological differences and I mean, there's a lot there, but I'd say some of those mentalities have been what, what enables, you know, humans at the end of the day, yes, these are robots, but humans that are using them, adopting them, scaling them, um, to, to build the relationship with, with the robot. Nice. Okay. Very cool. Um, so automation and robotics, you actually touched on this before about like the, the um, labor crisis or challenges that industries have been, um, your industry in particular has been experiencing. But on the whole, to the general public, they worry about like robots taking people's jobs and automation, like replacing humans and whatever it may be. Obviously, I'm not the same belief, but what, what's your take on that narrative, especially in the context of what you guys are building? Yeah. For sure. So, you know, whenever I hear that of like, you're taking jobs, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I like to point at the stats and, uh, right now there's 2 million open positions in hospitality in the U S alone vacant people are, again, it's a crisis to hire and retain, attract and retain. Right. So, so that is one thing is how can we be taking jobs if there's still 2 million open roles right now? Um, and then the other side is the turnover rates are extremely high. So in housekeeping in particular, uh, it's over 140% right now. So that means if you have a housekeeping staff of 10 people, all 10 of those people leave within a year and four of their replacements leave in that same year. And that's what you're dealing with. So, so that, that's the reality. That's just to level set and create the baseline of, okay, that that's the problem you're solving for. And yeah, are we taking on the task? Like, are we ultimately looking to replace vacuums, um, you know, in commercial real estate? It's like, totally, no human should be pushing around a vacuum today in five years from now and 20 years from now. Um, that's just not, it, there's other things that we can be doing as a society. And, and to be honest, the data suggests people don't want to be doing that anymore. They don't want their kids to be doing it anymore. Uh, another interesting stat is there's, the average age of housekeepers is 60 years old, six zero, uh, in the U S. So it's an kind of aging demographic, but they're switching to Amazon distribution centers and other areas. So, um, yeah, I, I could go on a while here, but I think that's kind of my, I like to reframe, um, because that's the reality of what you're dealing with. So how do you help the people that are doing that job? How do you make their lives easier? How do you take that load off and empower them? Our our approach is creating an ecosystem. This is our first vacuuming is not the end goal, but it's our first step towards a fully connected ecosystem that can work to, you know, tackle all these different tasks. And, um, yeah, and we're seeing, we're getting a lot of, you know, really positive feedback from users that they feel better at the end of the day. They feel less pain. They can hang out with their kids or their grandkids. Um, you know, there's a whole plethora of things that, uh, are really, yeah, empowering for me to and the team to hear too. I think when people in those positions that are, have that viewpoint think about, well, what does that look in the big picture? Now my employer is going to have tools, part of the workforce, because they're not going to replace all the humans. That's going to make my job easier, which means I'm going to be more engaged. I'm going to stay here longer. They don't have to replace me. My quality of life will be better. And then there's going to be a better service level. Plus, they don't have to go through all of that, like 
140% retention rate. And that's like an, ex, an extra expense and extra like headache in the year. So now my job is probably more secure and more enjoyable and my employer is more happy. And so is the, the, um, customer at the end of the day in the facility. So yeah. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. It's hundred percent. And it can be harder to quantify some of that stuff you said, but that's, that's the reality of like what's going on. And it's, we look at it and hear a lot more of it's a reallocation of labor versus like a reduction or replacement of labor. You can now level up those people or have those people do things they weren't able to do before. Um, because now vacuum's done. You press play, it's vacuum, it's clean. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, it's an interesting place that we're going. And again, the data suggests we're kind of outgrowing that as a society of what people are willing and wanting to do. So, yeah, definitely. Well, the, the industry again is it's at this fascinating juncture with so much innovation and so many things happening right now. And you touched on gen AI and all of that good stuff, but what are you most excited by of the trends in the next like five to 10 years and how do you see Taylor's fitting into the future? Yeah, totally. So there's a lot going on right now in AI and robotics. So uh, I love the trends of better sensor technologies and compute, right? NVIDIA has amazing technologies they've come out with and continue to come out with that kind of challenge assumptions from the past of GPUs and um, being able to do stuff in the cloud and things like that. So I think there's a lot of enabling technology trends that are transforming what we're able to build, what other roboticists are able to build. I think in terms of like vision and what I'm kind of what I want to be building and, you know, what we talk about a lot as a team is, uh, again, going back to that ecosystem, how do you create that ecosystem? How do you, um, you know, build this interconnected uh, group of robotics that, you know, some of which we're building, maybe it's partnerships with other companies, but multi-agent robotics or operations where you have a vacuuming robot working next to a scrubbing robot ne working next to security robot next to a delivery robot but not just async but they're actually working together they're communicating together that i believe is the future and of course humanoids is a big thing that's blown up in the past year too uh, i believe big time in humanoids um, and and love that i want to pursue that one day too but uh, i think before we fully get there where there's a universal humanoid uh, I think there's going to be this ecosystem of kind of decentralized robots that are working together and communicating together. So that, that I would say is um, a big trend I'm excited about and we're building uh, in-house ourselves uh, as well. Uh, and then the data side, I think is really interesting too. There's a lot of data that these robots can capture that bring value that you wouldn't even think of, right? Like, uh, you know, if we could detect mold in our robots, before a human does or before a human smells something or could get sick or whatever it might be. And now all of a sudden you're getting insights that we just can't see or detect today. Amazing. Do you think that those trends or those emerging technologies are some of like the ones that will have the biggest impact on the industry or is there something else that you think would in the short term have the biggest impact? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I do think generative AI is booming right now and for good reason. Like that's having a huge impact in how we're operating, how we're building, how much more we can do too, uh, and kind of leveling us up. So I think that in the shorter term is huge. Um, and then, you know, in the kind of mid, mid to longer term is that like where you start to see these ecosystems where robots deploy each other uh, and where all of a sudden it's it's invisible. It's all happening. I mean, yes, you see the robots, but it's like, that's it. They, you're not doing it. You don't have to intervene. <laughs> yeah. You're not pressing play. <laughs> some people will be worried about this. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah you, you hear that. There's some concerns there too, but yeah. I, yeah, I think we've got a hold on it for now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But let's talk about what's next for Talos. Are there uh, any upcoming products, partnerships, initiatives, things that you're most excited about or anything that you can actually share at this point? Yeah. So... Uh, a lot of exciting stuff going on. We've expanded now internationally. So we're in 12 countries around the world, uh, which is super exciting. Just launched in Korea a couple of weeks back, which is huge. So I think just one thing is getting more units out there and being able, like, I, it's cool pretty much weekly starting to get texts from friends or investors or others that are like, 
I saw your robot at this hotel or at this, you know, airport or whatever it might be. So, um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of technologies, we want to leverage this as a platform. So we have some stuff in the works related to kind of future uh, use cases outside of vacuuming, but doing other types of cleaning and, and servicing there. Uh, we're continuing to build out that data play that I told you about. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of partnerships, we have some interesting, confidential, but interesting conversations going uh, in terms of ways to partner with big brands uh, that have kind of this presence and distribution out there in the world today, too. So um, we're building something that's really unique and new. There's also a lot of you know players out there that are established and, and can kind of flood the world with robots, which is a big mantra of ours is let's flood the world with Rosie and with robots and uh, if we can do that even quicker with the support of somebody else, I think um, we want to do that. So that's perfect. A question that has come up in conversations that I've had in like roundtables and stuff like that with other founders that are looking at scaling their companies and um, having more of like distributed customer network instead of them, you know, hey, we're in the Bay Area and now customers are local. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. How have you dealt with that? Like I was speaking to one guy and he's like, oh, we've been selling in like Texas, but then they're shipping them to Mexico and we don't have like a support network there. We don't have like service network, nothing like that. Being in 12 countries, do you, how have you gone about that? Have you set up your own hubs? Do you have local team members or do you sell all from the US and then have distribution globally? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, definitely a big um, thing that we also had to build out, you know, initially, uh, not initially, but after we had product and we were able to scale that and inventory, um, how do we support this? How do we create the operations to back it up? So uh, first of all, I mean, the data flow of just having predictive analytics to track if robots are going to go down and deal with that. Our mentality again is, as of the best you guys know, AI, the best service is not needing service in my eyes. If you don't need to pick up the phone and call us, amazing. <laughs> Ideally, the robots don't break down, but they will inherently, right? So um, so a couple of things that we've done to that. One is we see issues before customers see issues. That's huge. We can contact them and, and kind of do that before they really experience downtime. Uh, another thing that we did is uh, the robot's really modular. So even though it has hundreds of components, it's very complex. We've designed the most, uh, the parts that would fail the most, certain motors and things like that, that just, again, inherently will fail over the course of two, three years. Um, the the end customer, the user, the people on site, engineering staff on site, don't even need a screwdriver to replace some of those components. So uh, that modular design is something that we set up in advance. We've patented now uh, with this approach and um, that makes it, we empower the end user, uh, which is quite different than Apple. <laughs> They're, you know, they got lawsuits about it, but, um, but now the, the, and users can do it themselves. Why even need to call us or text us? And you what if we could tell bar? you? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. But yeah, imagine so, no, not needing a genius bar. Yeah. So do you just like ship them the part? Say, hey, it's coming up for like service or this is like probably scheduled to be replaced. Just here's a step by step and do it yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, awesome. yeah, we'll go through like training. We have materials we can send them. Maybe they'll have spare parts on site if they have enough mm -hmm. robots. Maybe we'll just ship it out and they'll get it in a couple of days. But yeah, that's that's kind of the first layer. Uh, and then, you know, after that, if they're not able to do it, we partnered with a company. It's actually a printer company, like traditional printers. Yeah. Um, and they have technicians all over the world to service those. So they've actually leveraged those same technicians to service robots, which... Uh, ours, I think, are easier to service than their printers, which is cool. Yeah. Um, and and that's that, really yeah. helpful. Yeah. And then the last is like, okay, worst case scenario, we have to ship out, you know, a replacement robot. But that's pretty far and few in between. So, Very cool. All right. Well, thank you for sharing that. I know that's just off the cuff. wanted to ask that, but that's great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Look, it's been incredible conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time sharing your story, giving all of your insights uh, and everything else that you've been so gracious and sharing. So before we wrap up, are, are there anything else? Is there anything else that you think would be useful to share with some of the listeners, perhaps some advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or a glimpse into what excites you about the future, whether it's the space or the, or the company? 
Yeah, we covered a lot. I think it was a, it was a fun conversation and got me energized for sure. I think one thing I, I usually have something I say, but I'm going to mix it up here um, in terms of advice to earlier stage founders and just founders in general. Um, it's so important to take care of yourself. I have gone through a lot. One of our core values is relentless perseverance. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not invincible and I think strength is vulnerability, not pretending like everything's okay. So um, I think whatever it takes, you know, to, to put yourself first and um, whatever routines for me, it's meditation, biking, getting good sleep, you know, certain things that just I prioritize now. And, and it's not like, a, oh, if I have time, it's like, I, I must do this for myself. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm still at this today is um, because I believe so much in what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, but because I was, you know, started to create and it took a while to get there, but create a foundation so that, you know, I can come back to myself every day. So uh, that's great advice. Yeah. You can't give a hundred percent if you're not a hundred percent. So looking after yeah, yourself is, is exactly. very important um, and figuring out how you fit that into your day. Cause yeah, especially when you're running a company, it's, it can be 24 seven, but you've got to fit in everything else. I know you, you're married, you've got your health to think of, you've got to just navigate life in those important ways. That's great. That is perfect. Thank you. Um, where can our listeners find out more about you, about Taylor's follow you guys and your progress and achievements? Yeah, for sure. So we have a website, uh, com. That's probably the best springboard. And then I'm on LinkedIn and love to connect with fellow founders, uh, you know, anybody who's just thinking about this space too. So I'm Micah and on LinkedIn, I'm Micah Estes Green. Uh, and you'll see a nice Daft Punk helmet that I'm wearing. That's <laughs> kind of my, my personal branding. So feel free to reach out. Love that. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, I look forward to continuing following your story, your progress and all the other good things coming up. Great. Thanks so much, Greg.